Torah TV. The world is thinking. The history of philosophers' deaths is a history of weirdness, madness, suicide, murder, bad luck, pathos, and some very dark humor. Let me give you some examples that you can peruse at greater length, should you be so disposed. Pythagoras allowed himself to be slaughtered rather than cross a field of beans. Heraclitus suffocated in cow dung. Plato allegedly died of a lice infestation. Aristotle is reported to have killed himself with aconite. Empedocles plunged into Mount Etna in the hope of becoming a god, but one of his bronze slippers was spat out by the flames in confirmation of his mortality. Diogenes died by holding his breath. There are three or four philosophers in antiquity that died by holding their breaths. So did the great radical Zeno of Citium. Zeno of Elea died heroically by biting a tyrant's ear until he was stabbed to death. Lucretius was allegedly, um, allegedly killed himself by being driven mad by taking a love potion given to him by his wife. Hypatia. Hypatia, the greatest female philosopher in antiquity, was killed by a mob of angry Christians and her skin was peeled off with oyster shells. Always beware mobs of angry Christians, <laughs> particularly if they're carrying oyster shells. Boethius was cruelly tortured before being bludgeoned to death on the orders of the Ostrogoth king Theodoric. And during his time in prison, he writes the Consolations of Philosophy. John Scotus Erigena, the great Irish philosopher, was allegedly stabbed to death by his English students. Such is history. I'm from an Irish background. Avicenna died of an opium overdose after engaging much too vigorously in sexual activity. If there's one text from the history of, you might want to look at The, the Life of Avicenna by al Juzajani. it's fascinating. Another thing about the history of philosophy is that uh, if philosophers weren't civil servants, they were usually doctors, usually medics who were doing their philosophy on the side. Avicenna was one of those. So was John Locke. Aquinas died 25 miles from his birthplace after banging his head against the bough of a tree. Pico de la Mirandola, meteor of the Italian Renaissance was poisoned by his secretary, 25 years old. Seeger of Brabant was stabbed by his secretary. William of Ockham died of the Black Death. Thomas More was beheaded and his head was stuck on a pike on London Bridge. There's a wonderful story told in Aubrey's Brief Lives, which is one of the great texts, uh, of, of Thomas More's daughter in a carriage proceeding under uh, London Bridge and seeing her father's head on the, on the pike. And she says, would that his head would fall into my lap? At which point the head fell into her lap and she took it back to their house in Chelsea, pickled it in wine, and then buried it in the ground sometime later in St. Dunstan's Cemetery in Canterbury. Galileo narrowly escaped the fate um, of being burnt alive by the Inquisition. Giordano Bruno wasn't so lucky. He was burnt alive by the Inquisition. Bacon, Francis Bacon, died after stuffing a chicken with snow in the streets of London to assess the effects of refrigeration on animal flesh. This is a typical wonderful death. I mean, Bacon, who was the great philosopher of experimentation, traveling in his carriage through London, descends from it, has this, suddenly has this intuition that maybe you can freeze animal flesh in snow. It's a snowy day in London. So he orders uh, this, this woman to bring out a chicken, they slaughter it, and they proceed to cover it in snow to see whether the flesh will be refrigerated. He gets a chill, it turns into pneumonia, and he dies some days later. This is what we can call death by empiricism. Descartes died of pneumonia as a consequence of giving early morning tutorials in the Stockholm winter to the prodigious and cross-dressing Queen Christina of Sweden. Spinoza died in his rented rooms at The Hague while everyone else 
was at church. The death of Spinoza rapidly becomes legend. Three biographies appear within 10 years. Leibniz, who was discredited as an atheist, the German rhyme was Leibniz Glaubnix, Leibniz believes nothing, uh, died uh, alone and was buried at night with only one friend in attendance. The handsome and brilliant Irish philosopher John Toland died in such dire poverty in London that no marker was placed at his burial spot. Barclay, a fervent critic of Toland uh, and so-called free thinkers, died one Sunday evening on a visit to Oxford while his wife read him a sermon. Montesquieu, I like this one, died in the arms of his lover, leaving unfinished an essay on taste. <laughs> <laughs> the atheist materialist de la Maitrie, who was also a doctor, died of indigestion caused by eating a huge amount of truffle pâté. <laughs> and the deeper irony is that um, the feast was given in his honor by his patron in Prussia uh, for curing him from a, a potentially fatal disease. And the consequence being that Delametri stuffs it with um, truffle pâté. Rousseau died of massive cerebral bleeding, which was possibly caused by a violent collision with a great Dane. Not the Danish prince, but the dog on the streets of Paris two years earlier. Diderot choked to death on an apricot, presumably, presumably to show that pleasure could be had until the very last breath. There's a beautiful memoir of Diderot by his daughter, which describes this moment with great, great tenderness. They didn't even notice that he'd expired. Um, his wife's last words were, you shouldn't eat that. <laughs> you, shouldn't, <laughs> you shouldn't eat the apricot. And um, anyway, Condorcet was murdered by the Jacobins during the bloodiest years of the French Revolution. Hume and uh, David, the, the good David, Le Bon David, as they call him in France, died peacefully in his bed after fending off the inquiries of Boswell as to the atheist's attitude towards death. Hume's death is very important. I mean, Hume is the first philosopher, as it were, to really come out in denying the immortality of the soul. And there's an article of, by Hume which defends the right to suicide, which is published posthumously. So he had this reputation of being a skeptic or an atheist. <clears throat> Boswell, Samuel Johnson's biographer, uh, wanted to visit the dying Hume because he couldn't believe that an atheist could go to their death with contentment. And Hume being Hume admitted Boswell, not just once, but on two separate occasions, during which Hume and Boswell discussed the nature or the possibility of the soul's immortality. At the end of which, in exasperation, uh, Boswell said, do you not at least conceive the possibility that the soul is immortal. And Hume said, it is possible if I throw a piece of coal on the fire, it will not burn. Um, Kant's last words was sufficient. It is enough. Hegel died in a cholera epidemic, and his last words were, only one man ever understood me, and he never understood me. <laughs> eh? Nur einer hat mich verstanden, er hat mich nicht verstanden. Bentham had himself stuffed and sits on public view in a glass box at University College London in order to maximize the utility of his person. If you visit London, I urge you to go to the old building of University College London, the South Quad, and you can see Bentham in what looks like an old-fashioned uh, telephone box, sitting there in his, in his favorite uh, outfit with his stick dapple, uh, and, and, and he was obs and he, he carried he was he was very much concerned with his his demise and he wrote a text called the auto icon in which he describes his wish for his own body to be a sort of icon that would ridicule religious icons he was much concerned with the with the manner in which the new zealanders with which the english were at war for 30 years in the 19th century pickled heads and he wants his own head to be pickled in such a manner and he did that, and it went badly wrong. But in the last 10 years of his life, he carried in his pocket the, uh, the artificial eyes that would go in his... Um... Here was a man that faced death on a daily basis. Max Stirner was stung on the neck by a flying insect and died of the resulting fever. 
Kierkegaard's gravestone rests against that of his father in a Kierkegaard, a churchyard. Nietzsche made a long, soft-brained and dribbling descent into oblivion after kissing a horse in Turin. Moritz Schlick was murdered by a disturbed student who went on to join the Nazi party. Wittgenstein died the day after his birthday, and his friend, Mrs. Bevan, gave him an electric blanket, saying, many happy returns. Wittgenstein replied, staring at her, there will be no returns. <laughs> and Wittgenstein's last words are wonderful. He says, because the next day after he died, he, and he uh, was working until the end, uh, the extraordinary productive period. And the day after, he knew his friends were visiting uh, would arrive the day after his death. He knew he was going to die. And his last words were, tell them I've had a wonderful life. It's an extraordinary remark. And if you know about Wittgenstein's life, it's, wasn't, it doesn't seem wonderful. Giovanni Gentile was executed by anti-fascist Italian partisans. Ada Stein died in Auschwitz. Simone Weil starved herself for the sake of solidarity with occupied France during the Second World War. Sartre said, death, I don't think about it. It has no place in my life. 50,000 people attended his funeral. 